Today, I'm very happy to speak with Ron Lovett, a fascinating entrepreneur who built an amazing security company, sold it as in different board, different projects. Uh, he's also chairing uh, Vern Arnish's uh, board. And he has this uh, framework of three questions that he always ask in his company instead of policies uh, to basically empower people. The first question is, is it the right thing for our customer? The second question is, is it the writing for our company based on our purpose and values? And the third question is, is it something that you are willing to be accountable for? Fascinating discussion. Enjoy my conversation with Ron Lovett. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. And today I am delighted to speak with a fabulous entrepreneur. Uh, I don't know where to start. He, he started a security company in Canada sold it, uh, started other businesses, wrote books that we're going to talk about. Uh, he's the, the chair, I think, of the board of uh, Vern Arnish. Um, he's probably working halftime from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and the rest of it. Ron Lovett, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast today. Hey, Eric. Great to, great to be here and good to see you again. Thank you so much for taking the time with everything you're doing. Um, I was actually introduced to to you and what you do thanks to to Vern Arnish and uh, brought you as a, a speaker in one of his conference, um, and that's where I got the idea uh, with obviously the meetings and event industry. Uh, Source Security and Investigations is the company you started. Mm. How did you start it, and were you always uh, willing to be an entrepreneur, or is something that just uh, happened to be? Yeah, you know, that, that question comes up a lot. And I always said, for me, I, uh, you know, I certainly, like my grandfather was an entrepreneur. He had a small plumbing business. I never met him. He passed when I was maybe two. My real father, who's from Florida, was entrepreneurial for sure. Um, and so, so you know, I, I, I feel like there, it was probably my blood, but I was always, you know, what I call a hustler. I mean, I would always... Um, I was always incredibly curious, always wanting to make my own way. You know, I'd have three paper routes uh, as a child, cut hair in my mom's attic, you know, buy hats in the United States and sell them in Canada. I was always, it, from a very early age, I was starting these micro small businesses, making decisions, taking jobs that were more variable compensation. You know, there was a lot of that stuff. So there's early signs there for sure. And then you're working in security and you decide one day to, to start the company. How does that work? Yeah, so, so uh, that's interesting. So, so I was training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under a guy named uh, Henzo Gracie. So Henzo is the, from, from the famous Gracies. And I was going down to his school in New York to get my belts. And, you know, I was a, I was a shithead. Uh, and so <laughs> in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I was unwanted, which is, a, you know, a, a nice way of saying barred from every nightclub here in, in Halifax. You know, when I was 18, I was underage, but I was, I was kicked out of most just for, for causing trouble. And so when I turned 19, which is the legal drinking age here in Nova Scotia, um, I was hired by a few nightclubs to, to work the door. They'd say, look, the Ron Lovett guy, you know, seems to be able to look after himself. And, and even though he's not got a great reputation, we know he can, keep at least keep his friends out of here, you know? And so I would just show up with my metal detector and keep some of my own friends were just not allowed to come. And so that was a good thing. And so, so I built a bit of a name for myself and, you know, I think it was 20 uh, until, you know, 19 to 20. And then I was traveling. So I didn't really, um, I didn't complete university. I put a backpack on and, and, and I was traveling quite a bit. And my last trip, I did Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia for four months. And I was in Santa Marta, North Colombia, in a place called Park Tirona. And I was reading a book about this English gangster, a guy named Dave Courtney. And I think the book was called Stop the Ride, It's Time to Get Off, something like that. And anyways, in the book, it talks about how he had rented his friends, his gangster buddies, to nightclub security companies in London. And he would make $2 a guy. And, you know, he, someone would call him and say, I need 10, 10 guys, 10 tough guys. And he'd say, okay, I want two bucks per hour. And so he didn't have a company, but the, I understood the business model. And I thought, well, I could just be the company. And so I came back to Halifax and I decided, you know, to start my nightclub security company. And, and then I went back to the nightclubs and said, look, I, I, uh, I'm back. And they said, well, look, you know, these places 
aren't as safe as when you were here. So we need you to come back. And I said, I will, but I, I need to come back as a company. It's not Ron Lovett anymore. It's, it's a company. And, and a quick funny story about the company name. So I owned a set of flats uh, when I was 21. Yeah, I had returned from, from Columbia and I owned the set of flats and, and I had the three bedroom upstairs. There was a young group of girls from Ireland and I told them I'm going to start a security company. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, great. They said, uh, what, what do you want to do? And I said, nightclubs and bodyguard work and concerts and all that stuff. They said, oh, there's a company called um, Source Security and they do everything in Ireland. They do everything. And so, so I just, I, I heard what they said and I was, because the security industry had these old, old names, you know, like Eagle Security and there was no kind of new, new age names and, and the logos were all old. And so I just was playing around with names. I couldn't land on anything and Source Security just kept coming back in my head. And I thought that just sounds really cool. And so I registered Source Security and I went back to the girls and I said, look, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to use the name Source Security. And they looked at me confused and I said, why would we care if you use that name? And I said, well, you know, Source Security, the, the company from Ireland. They said, what do you mean? I said, the company from Ireland, Source Security. They said, no, 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 it's called Sword Security. <laughs> so, you know, as bad as entrepreneurs are, are, are as listeners, this time it actually paid off. My horrible listening skills paid off. And so uh, I, I, I called my company Source Security. And I, I actually saw Sword Security years later while traveling Ireland. And they eventually expanded to Canada. So, so thank you, Sword Security, in a weird way. That, that, that's funny. I'm glad I'm not the only one with an accent problem. That, that's good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Are you still practicing uh, jujitsu? You know, no, uh, I have a gym at home. I, I'm, I'm about to do my second hip surgery. So jujitsu was a lot, you know, I had bad knees and I really enjoyed it. You know, I've been to Brazil and trained as well. Love jujitsu, trained with some good friends here who have schools. Um, but, you know, um, and I always wear the ear muffs so I don't have cauliflower ears. I had a few little pieces growing and, and yes. they are still there, but nothing serious. And, but, but tough on the hips, you know? And so I had a hip surgery uh, two years ago, on my left hip, I'm, I'm ready to go for my right hip, just scopes. So just, you know, I've got cartilage in there and they, they, they shave, I've got bone spurs. They'll shave the bones down. So no, I don't do jujitsu anymore. I'm too old. I'm 41 now. I mean, come oh, on. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I should remember that age, but uh, I have a friend in Toronto, Elliot Baev. He's got a a um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu school. Right. And we were all debating. And then uh, w one guy here in South Florida, uh, Vito Belfort. Uh, amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, amazing. I know. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was speaking for EO one day. And I asked him, so Brazilian jiu-jitsu or, or Krav Maga? Because I'm a big fan of uh, KM. And he said Krav Maga. And so all the really? people in the room say, why? Because there's no rule in Krav Maga. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because he's <laughs> a jiu-jitsu guy. Yeah, yeah. So you're starting this company. You're obviously good in martial art as well. Uh, and and how, how do you start recruiting people? How do you start training people? And how do you get into the the meetings and even industry to to get more more gigs? Yeah, I mean, I'd start with high school friends. You know, I mean, I mean, these were guys that I went to high school with, and so it me, you know, start with me and two guys at one bar called the Planet Pool, which is doesn't exist anymore. And so, so you know, I had a lot of friends, and then. And, and as it grew, you know, there, you'd blink and there was 40 of us and you blink and there were 60 of us and you blink and there was 350 of us working a Rolling Stones concert. I mean, we just grew very quickly. And, and I think, you know, it's like anything when you start and, and maybe it's changed today. Social media wasn't big and people weren't cheering you on. People would poke at your ideas and, and tell me why it wasn't going to work, you know, because no, you know, and especially you know, here in Atlantic Canada, unfortunately, and, and you know, in some cases, if it hasn't been done, it's not going to work. Uh, that mentality can, has happened. I think it's going away. Mm -hmm. um, but so I was certainly told that this idea wouldn't work because no one had done it before. Of course, I saw it done in the UK. So I said, well, someone's done it before. It's working somewhere. And um, so, yeah, just, just hired uh, friends and, and, you know, which, which became a valuable lesson. I, I still get that question today from young entrepreneurs is, how do you separate friends and business? And luckily I had started so young at 21 working with friends and, and I would make it very clear, Hey Eric, you know, when we're at work, we're at work. We can have a beer afterwards. We can hang out in the weekend, watch the game, but we're at work. We're at work. Do you understand that? And you'd say, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. And so 
I was able to kind of conquer that one uh, quickly out of the gates, making very clear the line between when we're at work and when we're not, and that those are different relationships. Yeah, very good. Um, now you, you just mentioned the, the Rolling Stone concert, like if it was something like today, I would say, oh, it's a nice weather outside. But in your book, Outrageous Empowerment, which, by the way, yeah. is absolutely amazing when it, it comes to uh, building a culture. But you t you're telling that story or or is it when when you spoke for, uh, with Vern? But can you please share that story? Because I, I just love it. So which one? Just about the... The Rolling Stone and how you, you get the, the, the contract with the Rolling Stone and did they ask you... Uh, Well, you know, when they come to you, say, sure, I can do that. And then you wonder afterwards, oh, am I going to deliver that? Oh, yeah. You know, I think I, think I know what part this was. Well, so this was in Moncton, which is in New Brunswick, East Coast, Canada. And there was 85,000 people at that concert. And we were hired. Now, we had one. I had no business operating a Rolling Stones concert. I mean, we had 45 of us, maybe 50 of us doing nightclubs in Halifax. And so... As this story goes, we were hired by a big security expert out of Toronto. And, and of course, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, 360, yeah, 380, no problem. We'll, we'll do that. No idea how we're going to pull this off. And so, so you know, this, this was really a stressful time because we had our regular operations. Then we were going to try to somehow come up with 380 people that we didn't know to work one day, one shift, 16 hours and done in the hot sun. And so, you know, of course everyone's recruiting. We're trying to get as many people. If you had an uncle, your, your mother's friends, husband, sister's friends, cousin, we would hire them for this. We needed people. Uh, there was probably only 50 of us, if that, who really could handle themselves and, and do security, but not everybody, you know, different roles are made for different, different positions in that, in that industry. But, but it was very challenging. And, and, I, and I think the story you're referring to is one of them was, uh, we had hired uh, five buses to take everybody from Halifax to New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And so I went to New, New Brunswick waiting and, uh, and we had the five buses and they were probably $2,500 per bus and they each fit around 50 people. And I remember there was a guy named Brett back in Halifax and he calls me and I'm waiting like, because you, you know, you recruit, everyone says they're going to show up, but you don't know who's going to show up. And most people back then, they're only working to, to watch the show anyways. They're not really looking for trouble. These are just one day. They don't owe, owe us anything. They don't care about the money. They just want to see the stones. And so, and so anyways, he calls me, says, Ron, I have, I have really bad news. I said, what's, you know, what could be wrong? And he says, well, we have five buses here, but we only have one bus full and there's 10 people on the second, the rest are empty. And I'm just like, oh, oh no, 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 no. And, you know, I mean, you talk about a moment where your stomach drops, like it dropped below my feet. And I just thought I'm done. Like I, I can't have 60 people guards here. Like we're, we're finished. No concert 80. Like I, you know, I thought I was good at security. I'm not that good. Uh, I can't pretend to be 300 people. I just thought I'm finished. I, I didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't know what I was going to do, you know, because as, as entrepreneurs, we're problem solving all the time. This one was too big. What do you, how, you know, I've got hours now, to actually, I had one day, this was the day before they were coming up to, to, to uh, camp overnight. Anyhow, what had happened was these people just didn't want to get the bus and we were not organized with passing information back and forth. So most of them just drove up. And so literally there was cars coming in, cars coming. And I was like, I literally, like, I'm not religious. I got on my knees and thank God, Jesus and everybody I could even get my, you know, would listen to me and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a wild day. We pulled it off. There was, uh, you know, hell behind the scenes, but we got, we got it done and nobody died and, and uh, the concert went off fine. Phenomenal. And obviously that launched another level of your company, Uh, thanks to that concert, right? Yeah, you know, we had, we, we, I think the book talks about that, this, you know, this concept of we, we there was two groups ahead of us, i.e., you know, in charge of us, a group from Montreal and a group from Toronto. After that, we became the authority. You know, we, we pulled it off. You know, I went out to Pemberton Festival. That was Jay-Z, Tom Petty, Coldplay. Mm -hmm. Went out there just to help out with a few things. And within 48 hours, I was running that entire festival had a, you know, basically director of security. And so it was really, we were making a name for ourselves on, wow, these people understand how humans come into concerts, where the, where the gaps are, how to solve problems. You know, we just had a unique ability, not just myself, but the team on 
how do you solve a problem that you can't process real time in the moment? Something goes wrong. How do you solve that problem? That's not easy. You can't, it's hard to train for that. Yeah. You, you need to have experience. You need to be fast on your feet. And we had that ability and we could deliver. And that was, um, that was surely helpful to, to building that business. And, and one thing that I love um, the way you explain it and how you build a company is how you are able to uh, basically let people use their brain, uh, especially when people would tell you, no, 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 you cannot let that type of people make a decision, uh, like the the one who, uh, who find a new vehicle that had to buy. Okay. Sorry? Oh, Shwani, right? Yeah. The famous, he bought the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, look, that industry, as as of many, and not just in private security, I think there's huge cop- corporations that still run this command and control, which is we pay you, you do what we want when we want it, and how dare you if you don't. Yeah. And I just thought that's not working for me. And it did take rock bottom, you know, that question of what if I had to restart this industry from scratch? And through that, there was two things. Give people their brains back, build systems and processes to allow people to be have autonomy and make decisions and build culture mm-hmm. in an industry that lacked culture. Those were the two things that I became obsessive about when I was at rock bottom and lost a million dollars in 2011. And, and yeah, it was, you know, I remember reading Dan Pink's book, um, Drive, which is right, a great right. book, right? And it talks about those four things, mastery, or three things, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. We added community. We, I think, he, you know, from my perspective, my experience, that was missed. That was the fourth thing, creating community. And, and so, but uh, autonomy is a scary one because I think people have tried autonomy, Eric. They say, oh, well, you know, I've told people make decisions, but that's that's too broad. Oh, Eric, go ahead and make decisions. And just and then people, the, the system for autonomy that we hear is act like you're an owner. Well, guess what? You're a different owner than me. You're not going to make the same decisions. And so we we set people up for failure. Mm-hmm. We we really were looking for how do you systemize autonomy? And so for us, there was three simple questions. If you're about to do something that you don't regularly do and it's outside of the norm and you you don't know how to move forward with it. Ask yourself three simple questions. Is it the right thing for the customer, yes or no? Is it the right thing for our business based on our purpose of changing the industry and our values? And are you willing to be accountable? If the answer is yes, 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 don't ask anybody, just do it. We'll deal with it afterwards, but we'll support you in your decision-making. And so that allowed people, that that's this coin, give people their brains back. It's not that nobody had brains. It's we gave them back. They got to use them again, you know, because our industry took brains away. And so, um, so yeah, it was great. I mean, just to see people flourish and make better decisions than I could have ever made. Um, they became new standards. You know, you had people that would make decisions in, in complex situations and we would celebrate that. We would tell everybody that's the new standard for the company now. And in some cases it didn't work out. We would coach them real time, just like sports. Hey, Eric, uh, just like your coach would have done. They didn't, you know, you don't wait in sports to coach someone at the end of the season, halfway through the season, a quarter way through the season or end of the game. It's real time. We do the same thing. That decision-making process allowed us to move very fast and remove the bureaucracy because, and you know, you mentioned Vern Harnish and uh, Vern's on my board. I chair his board and and we've got a great relationship. And he once said to me, you know, I took that um, entrepreneur master's program at MIT through EO. And he said one year, I was, as I was a student, he said, you know, as we scale businesses, unfortunately, we add complexity. The real question is, how do you simplify things as you scale? And that decision-making process was our version of that, right? Because that wasn't adding more policies and procedures and process. Yeah. It was it was dummy it down, keep it simple, let people make mistakes and let them flourish. And, and you give them the, the framework uh, to make Correct. decisions. Correct. Yeah, because because people when you when you just say hey make decisions, I mean they're on eggshells. They don't know how that's going to work. If if you know they're still anxious, there's no format, no guidelines, no framework. That's mm-hmm. what people need. Absolutely. And in the meantime, when I'm I'm listening to you and is you say okay, the three question uh, is it right for the customer? Is it right for a company based on purpose and values? And would you take uh, ownership for it? That is not only in in, uh, in our industry or your industry. I think it's it's a question of people when I see it everywhere, people that are afraid of their shadows, afraid to, to take decisions because they're not empowered to do right. so. But the, the command and control um, usually 
for me, is a sign of uh, the, the lack of confidence that uh, a, a leader ha- has in her or his own uh, capabilities of running the company. Yeah, and, of course. And, 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 and it, uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say it also holds people back because command and control is people come to you and say, hey, Eric, I need to make a decision. I have a stock point. I don't know what to do. You make all the decisions for me. Please help me. So I don't grow. I don't learn. Uh, and either do you, you know, you hold me back and then you end up with a gazillion things on your to-do list and your email, your door in your office is nonstop. You've created a monster with your own ego, right? Yep. And you become the main blocker in, in the company. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing that uh, I, I had to laugh uh, when internally when you say that is the, uh, when you're coaching somebody on the spot which is obviously the right thing to do. But I'm <laughs> thinking of different examples that I know of basically companies that are doing evaluation like once a year. And yes. I mean, the people are gone uh, <laughs> when the evaluation comes. Well, think, think how non-fresh that information is. So, so, so like, let's walk through this, the logic of the yearly review. Mm-hmm. So, okay, Eric, you, I, I, you report to me and I, I, I keep notes in some magical file of all the good and bad things you do. And the best of my ability, I try to recollect these things. Mm-hmm. And then I maybe ask some of your peers how you're doing. And, and they, 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 they challenge, they have challenges over the, the last year. They're, they're, it's really, are, are they happy with you today is probably all they're going to remember. Um, the good and bad of the last 48 hours. And so then there's this anxiety of, oh, oh okay, I'm going to talk to Ron. I wonder what he's going to say. And, and and like it's like this pressure cooker, uh, and, and it really doesn't do anybody any favors, you know. When we um, when we do that, and I think we just we we hold people back from from their potential uh, by not telling them, coaching them in real time, or celebrating them in real time. Like, why are you waiting a year to celebrate someone as well? Right? It's 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 horrible. Absolutely. And and was it Jeff? No, I I don't know who mentioned. Um, instead of uh, celebrating afterwards, actually when, when, when you have a friend who's an entrepreneur starting their own business, actually celebrate them then when they're starting their business to get some support and, and momentum going. And I have a blank, I don't, it's one of those very well-known uh, influencer that, what is Gary V or, 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 or uh, I don't know who said that, but mm. it's so true to get in the moment and supporting people and doing it when, when it's happening instead of, so of course, it just like logically makes sense. But you know why we do the quarterly, the bi-yearly, the yearly is because that's habit. That's what we've seen. That's what we think is the norm. We need to stop thinking of what, you know, because something's happened is the way it should be, right? I mean, there's the old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I hate that saying. I talk about in the book. If it's not broken, break it, put it back together better than you found it. That means that you should challenge everything, even when it's fine. And that's how you'll build a great business. That's how you come up with innovative ideas. Absolutely. And that's actually uh, the, the past crisis and the subprime. Uh, back in Brussels, I still had my uh, corporate event company. And I came up with a new methodology with my business partner because when I was asking a commercial director, what do you do the sales meeting? The answer I got was, oh, we do it every year. And I was like, oh, my God. And then I got to justify the cost and everything. But coming back to what you said about the second question, is it good for the company based on our purpose and and values? There's something you say about purpose that I just love. Uh, Find a purpose that's going to give you goosebumps, what I call goosebumps purpose. Mm. So powerful that it would be a conversation starter and I would hold people accountable to it. Right, right. When and how did you come to that concept? And how did you translate it into uh, your company? Yeah, I think it's a journey because I don't think I knew the power of a strong purpose when I first heard of what purpose was. I mean, even, I, I don't know if I started before I heard Simon Sinek say his stuff and I'm, you know, I, I'm not well versed on, I didn't read the book Why, so I don't know if he's saying the same thing. But You know, you hear some people say our purpose is to deliver the best customer service we can to our stakeholders or whatever. It's just like you want to fall asleep, right? And so that isn't a conversation starter. If your purpose doesn't at least have someone become curious and say, well, what do you mean? Tell me more about that. So, you know, change the private security industry. That became, the purpose also became our elevator pitch. When we would talk to customers and they say, hey, what makes you different than competitors? 
Because everybody else, including me, used to say, well, you know, our training is better and our onboarding is better and our, we have the best people, we have the best technology. And everybody says the same shit, you know? And so finally, when it was, I'll tell you what separates us from the competitors, we exist to change the private security industry. And they would say, they would just look at me and say, well, what do you mean? What, what does that even mean? Tell me more. Here's what this means. You know, and I would just start going through this entire conversation, start to show them under the hood of our car on how we did that. And so our pur purpose, you know, obviously my business today, Vita Living, it, the purpose is revolutionize affordable communities. It's a conversation starter. People say revolutionize affordable. What does that even mean? Like, well, how do you do that? Tell me more. Mm -hmm. And so it attracts people to the business. It attracts investors to the business. It, it, it allows us to hold people accountable. And what I mean by that is, are we creating a new system, a new process, a new product that allows us to continue to revolutionize affordable communities? The answer is yes or no. If it's something a competition does, then it's not revolutionizing. If it's something that we know about, then it's not revolutionary, you know? And so we can constantly check and balance. If you have the right purpose, you can check and balance your decisions, people's uh, decisions in the organization, suppliers and what they're bringing to the table with that purpose, if you get it right. Otherwise, you know, everyone's just going to fall asleep. And how powerful is it to align everybody internally? Correct. Correct. That's right. Yeah. When we kick off our quarterlies, we check in our purpose. What have we done to add to the purpose? Where we think we're off? You know, I mean, we constantly talk about that. Absolutely. And one of the other thing that uh, I really like uh, when you mentioned uh, in Outrageous Empowerment is how you're recruiting people. And you said, first question, would you be excited to rehire that individual based on what you know about them today? And second, who's, your, who's on your bench? Mm -hmm. if you have to replace that person. It is not something that is intuitive, right? It's something that you, you put in place, you train people, uh, you're always repeating the same message. How, how do you uh, instill that in the company? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a few pieces. One, just that question alone, right? Because, and I think this might be something Vern Heiner says, um, it, it, with leaders back to, you know, giving people autonomy. But look, as leaders, the greatest leaders today, I believe, they don't solve problems. They ask the right questions, right? And they, they let the organizations answer them. And that tells you if you have a smart organization or not, by the way. Uh, but in this case, trying to, I think for leaders, for entrepreneurs, getting to questions that allow you to be objective about the things that you've created is very smart because we're in it. And so we're emotional. It's our business. And so it's really tough to be objective. And so the creating questions that drive ob objectivity for me have been quite helpful, i.e., Ron, knowing what you know about your CFO, your this person, your that person, would you be excited to rehire them for the same position they do today? Would you be excited? Knowing what you know about them, would you be excited to rehire them today? That's yes or no. You know, you, people have good and bad days, but that's it, using the word excited changes that that changes the sentence a little bit yeah. and that creates clarity when I, when that question hit me and i think it was like jim collins asked that question i think in good to great and i just added the word excited to it and i just went back and i was like boom 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 gone 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 you know like <laughs> i am not excited about anybody here and i now i'm excited about everybody i certainly have changed that and then the virtual bench is just you know It, this is not recruiting is not the job of a recruiter. It's not the job of HR. I think people have to get that out of their heads. If you want to build a high performing, sustainable organization, it's everybody's business. Every leader, every employee should be recruiting them. And that doesn't mean everybody's running ads. That's BS. It's everybody's had a conversation with somebody or multiple people that said, Hey, Eric, I'm the CEO of this company. We met at a cocktail party. It's Vita Living. Our purpose is revolutionize affordable communities. We've got these roles coming up. I'm excited. I'm talking about the business. I'm gauging your level of excitement. You're, you're you know, maybe you're a construction manager. And, and then I ask the question, I say, hey, I don't, I don't have any openings right now. But Eric, if I ever had an opening for the, what you love to do, which is construction manager at my company, would you, be, would you be open to the conversation? Yeah, Ron, I would. Boom, you're on the bench. That's it. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. That's the concept of a virtual bench, not run ads and waste people's time and do interviews when you don't need to do them. It's, it has nothing to do with that. And so 
The other side of that coin is that if you have a culture where people know that even if you do a great job, the leadership team probably has other individuals for continuity purposes that are on the bench, it kind of holds everybody accountable. It eliminates, the, you know, allowing people to get lazy. Yeah, or complacent. That's right, right? Because the old thing is, you know what? Years ago when I had a company, I did have managers that would just firefight all day long. They'd say, Ron could never get rid of me. And as I started, as you read on my journey and, and shifting things around, that went away and that, that was gone. Now, nobody says, what would the company do without me like that? I don't even know if people have that thought anymore. We'll always survive, you know? Nobody's irreplaceable. Correct. And so being, being transparent about that, I think is important. Knowing and, and being purposeful. And I'm not as, you know, some months we're um, extra busy. And so I don't spend as much time building that bench, but I'm constantly building the bench. And that is, that's the job of leaders. You know, you owe it to the organization, to the team to build that bench. Yeah. And as my late father used to say, the proportion of idiots is the same in every organization at every level. So you want to <laughs> reduce that number. That's right. And I witnessed recently um, an example of exactly uh, what you're talking about, building the bench or having somebody on the bench. I was uh, at dinner with a friend in Orlando and he's working for one of those major parks. And uh, the waitress was absolutely amazing. The, the way she behaved, the conversation, the, the question she asked, quite frankly, outstanding. And sure enough, he pulled out his business card and he said, if you're looking uh, to, to find a, another job one day, uh, please call me because <laughs> he's seen in, in practice what that person can deliver. Right. Yeah, beautiful. So... Now that you've read, uh, you've written uh, Outrageous Empowerment and that uh, I know um, we also uh, talked about uh, being a, a coach and accelerator and you, you developed the, the program there in Nova Scotia. You're coming up with how to, the book, Scaling Culture and Masterclass. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, so you know, Outrageous Empowerment was a story. It really is a story, you know, uh, I've, my, my family, we have a history. We we're, we we have Irish, you know, we come from Ireland, um, Irish her, Irish heritage and great storytellers. My uncle, Sean Conley is just the master storyteller. And, and I love storytelling. So outrageous empowerment was just a story. It was really, you know, I, when I talk about the book, I say, you know, it's, it's, it's not what you think, Eric, it's not a, a take your high letter book. There might be some sections, but it's get the popcorn book, right? Like you could probably, most people who read that book have learned but they've also cried and laughed. You know, I've really had people say, geez, I kind of cried at some parts of this. And, and then I cried laughing and I belly laughed sometimes. And so, uh, you know, it was made to, to be a bit of a roller coaster for, for the reader and to make it seem like you were in the living room having a discussion with me. And so because of that, the, the second book, I wanted to be the how to, you know, that like how to build and sustain a resilient, high performing organization. This one I wanted to be a little different. This one is, and, and you know, I've got draft three right here. So, so this Eric is the how to, it's the playbook. It's the one that it would, you know, it would have been great for me to read a story like outrageous empowerment. Cause I, I didn't have a playbook, but, but I would have loved the playbook would have been really helpful. Like, okay, great. I love that story. But how exactly would I do that? If I was going to try it, what, what are some ways I could achieve that? And, and so I wanted to create the, the, the playbook for people. Uh, it was the one I didn't have, you know? And so we're really excited. We've got a master class that we'll launch with it that, that can be taken online. And, and, and this book is not just my content. You know, I've, I've uh, as you know, I've got the Scaling Culture podcast and we speak to leaders like Francis Frey, um, David Marquet, we've, we've got, you know, people yep. and cultural leaders from Microsoft and, and Zoom and, and just, just the best and brightest. And a lot of people that you, people haven't heard from and, and um, companies that we haven't had access to. And so it's great. I've, I've, I've really grabbed some of that, be, the, the, some of that key content and push people for the how to not theory and put it in the book as well. So I'm, I'm excited. I really think this will land well. I, I you know, I've got a forward from uh, Sherry Conway. She's uh, one of the senior HR leaders uh, at Southwest Airlines and a key advisor to me. And, and she's doing the forward. And, and she says, and it like, this is like Ron beat me to it. This is the book I wanted to write, you know? And, and I think a lot of people will feel, they'll either feel like, wow, finally all the things that 
are out there, are into a book, or wow, finally some help to help me along the way. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, that people enjoy the read. I'm sure it will. Uh, I truly enjoy the first book. I'm sure it's going to be great. And do you have any royalties to pay to Vern Arnish with scaling culture? You know, uh, you know, it's funny. So, uh, so I talked to Vern, it was in a Toronto dinner. We were both speaking. He asked me to come speak with him at a YPO conference. This is two yeah. years ago now. And we're at dinner and I just love scaling. You know, I love the word scaling. And uh, so we're out for dinner. I said, Vern, I hope you're okay. I'm, I'm going to, I want to call the book Scaling Culture. He said, yeah, geez, absolutely. I don't own the word scaling. I, you know, I use it a ton and it's in our ecosystem, but he said, I think it applies well. So I wanted to get his blessing and I'll tell you, a very funny, um, cause it's worth telling how I connected with Vern. It's a lot of people say, you know, how did, how did you, you know, how did you get on Vern's board and chair's board and run his strategic planning sessions and have him on your board? And, and how did this all start? He's actually an investor in Vita as well. And funny enough, I, you know, I had seen Vern talk lots and I was trying to get outrageous empowerment in his hand. This is before it was in print. And he was at, you know, the GLC for EO speaking. Yeah. He was speaking at MIT at, at yeah. the Entrepreneur's Master Program. And I was always the 14th, 15th, you know, idiot waiting to bug him, you know, in, in lineup. And, and he, you know, every time I get up there, he'd fluff me away like a bad fart. Like, I've got better things to do, kid. What do you want? <laughs> and so I would always try to get the book in his hands. And he says, look, I don't take like word versions of books. Like, do you have one that you could maybe send me? And I didn't even have one at that point. And so finally, when I got one, uh, he asked for an e-version. I, I didn't have it on like Kindle yet. It was a total disaster trying to get his attention. He didn't you know, answer one of every few emails I would send to him. And then finally, I sent a final email. And, and I have this post, I have it actually framed in my office now. And it says, my email said, look, Vern, I really want you to read Outrageous Empowerment and just read to chapter three. And just confirm that you read to chapter three. And if you get to chapter three, just say, Ron, read to chapter three. I'll send a check for $1,000 to the charity of your choice. That's all I'm asking. And I don't care if you burn it. I don't care if you continue to read it, whatever. Just, just confirm that you got to chapter three and, and who do I make the check out to? And I was having a rough day and I, I remember coming home and I pop up my email and it's from Vern Harner says, wow, I don't like your book. And I'm just like, I almost grabbed my phone and just rifled it out the window. I was, I was losing it. It said, I love it. And okay. it's an incredible story and blah, blah, blah. And he says, I want you to come speak at our conference in Denver, Colorado. And so he says, keynote uh, a portion of our, our, of our conference. So I was like, oh my God, this went from like the email was a low and then a huge high. So, so as the story goes, I went and uh, spoke at his conference, got, got a, uh, an award uh, for, I think, best scaling business or speaker or something like that at that conference. I asked Vern to, uh, actually from there, he, he coined Outrageous Empowerment, the top book of 2018, top business book. It was the top of his list. So the book kind of started to take off a little bit. Then um, I asked him to join uh, our advisory board for Conley Owens. He asked me to join his. I led his strategic planning session uh, last year in Marathon, Florida, and then chaired his his council. And he since became an investor at Vita. Like we've just really had a, had, had a great relationship. And, you know, I always talk about, you just, you need to kind of reach for the stars and you just don't know, you know, so that email, I would have never known where that email was going to carry from him claiming the book is top in 2018 to board work to relationships. I mean, you, just, you know, he's come to visit in Halifax, spoke at the EO conference, stayed with me and my family at our, at our summer home. I mean, we've just had a great relationship and you just, you, you have no idea the power of, and, and of where something will take you when you, when you have the courage to make a move, you know? Absolutely. And I love the story. And I love the way you tell the story. That is so inspiring. So th thank you for sharing that uh, with us today. How do people get in touch with you? Yeah, you know, I'm really active on LinkedIn, you know, so, so a lot of our content, you'll see two sides. I'm, I'm certainly talking a lot on culture, some leadership stuff uh, on LinkedIn. So, so I'd love for anybody who wants to follow me or join the conversation. Ronlovett.ca, uh, I, I think is our website or .com. I think it's .ca. And so I do some speaking um, virtually and, uh, and, and at conferences. And, um, you know, and then uh, my other company, Vita Living, vitaliving.ca, you know, that revolutionized affordable communities. We're doing a ton of great work out there, buying apartments in Canada and in the U.S. now as well. And so, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a busy year. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited. I, I, you know, I don't do a ton of speaking, but I do some, I'm, I'm obviously busy with a young family and, um, and with work. And so just trying to, to keep the best balance I can. That's awesome. And my, my last question, Ron, for today, uh, and thank you again for taking the time. You met, you mentioned that you were at a conference in Toronto with Vern. Um, there is so many great entrepreneurs in Toronto. It's like a nest. And one for me is is really revolutionizing the way people meet and community. And he has created this community called Mastermind Talk. His name is Jason Gainyard. I am a big fan of, of everything he does. He's absolutely phenomenal human being. And the reason I'm talking about him is he always came back with this question, which I love, and I want to ask it to you. When we meet in one year with a bottle of champagne, what are we going to celebrate? Great question. I love it. Um, so... A few things, right? I think one, I've got a, a, a new child being born in August, so I'll have my third child. So that will be the first celebration. Um, I would say I will have picked up and started to learn how to play the piano. So I'll play a song for you. So we'll celebrate that. In business, uh, a year from now, I think Vita will go from owning 600 units to over 2000. So we'll have over a quarter billion in assets in a year um, and, and, and really move to make a larger impact in people's lives and have some more powerful stories of helping individuals get ahead uh, from our business model and, and, um, and the communities that we're in and, and what we're providing. And so really excited about that. And um you know, maybe depends on things go. Maybe I, maybe, you know, maybe I build a small, um, what do you call it? greenhouse where I can have my own vegetables. We'll see about that one, but that would be a nice one. I would certainly crack the champagne for that. Awesome. And I, you know what I like with people like you and entrepreneurs, uh, what they want to do in one year is some, something that people don't even do in their life. So I I'm ready to drink champagne with you for that. Thank you so there much you for being on the show today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. You take care. Thank you, Ron, for taking the time to speak with me today. Just love everything you're doing and the very inspiring stories and you're a fascinating storyteller. If you want to get in touch with me, please reach out on LinkedIn or join my Facebook group at www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group when we talk about everything related to owning your business in the meetings and event industry. Thank you.